SEN started because of boredom. Troops in Panama wanted radio entertainment, and on April 1941, they got their wish. The Coast Artillery Command ran the original station using a tactical frequency and low power. The station's call sign was PCAN, and it was sponsored by the Panama Canal Department Command newspaper, The Jungle Mudder. PCAN brought the troops news, music, and sports, and it was the beginning of the oldest network in AFRTS. In fact, it preceded AFRTS by almost a year. In 1942, AFRTS was AFRS, and by 1943, AFRS had established a station in an empty barracks room at Fort Clayton. A year later, it moved to Albrook Field, relocating one last time to its present home on Clayton in 1952. In 1954, the AFRS station became the Caribbean Forces Network. Then, on May 6, 1956, the Caribbean Forces Network, CFN, added another element to its entertainment roster, television. Um, I was uh, a young kid uh, when SCN went on the air, and actually it was, uh, I believe, uh, they called it CFN, the Caribbean Forces Network. And, uh, of course, it was, uh, back in those days, uh, it was very primitive. It was all black and white. Uh, and, it, and the TV station only went on for several hours during the day. I don't uh, recall exactly how many. And I could see the people outside the commercial establishments on the sidewalks, watching monitors and TVs, uh, even watching the test pattern. Now augmented with television, CFN also received some additional manpower, but in a non-traditional way. I had been uh, transferred to Albrook Air Force Base to the Caribbean Air Command as an intelligence specialist and worked there until I had a chance to get a little bit of experience in uh, radio broadcasting at an English language station in Panama City, HOG. Based on the fun I had doing that, I requested a transfer to CFN and uh, finally was accepted at uh, CFN and was assigned there for the remainder of my four-year tour in the Air Force. Jack Essex's broadcasting experience was limited to some off-camera work at his previous assignment in New Mexico. Like all good broadcasters, he knew it never hurts to inflate your resume just a little bit. I met a gentleman who was also an airman assigned uh, to Albrook who had picked up a job moonlighting at that station and he was due to rotate back to the United States. He took me in and made the introductions to uh, the program director and recommended they consider me to replace him. And of course we both blew up the little bit of off-camera experience I had at uh, Albuquerque and they accepted me and I worked there on a part-time basis for a few months. Essex was CFN's morning DJ. The program ran from 7 until 10 and played music probably considered by today's standards as Muzak. When the show's DJ was in California visiting his mom, who was recovering from surgery, he made some purchases to spice up the program's music mix. So while I was here, I stocked up on a few of the uh, current hits. People like Elvis, Gene Vincent, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, recording artists that still hadn't made it down to CFN but were becoming popular in the United States. So I took them back, 45 RPMs as I recall, and I started sprinkling those throughout my uh, morning broadcast and probably sprinkled them a little heavier than I should have because it uh, caused a visit from the major who suggested rather firmly that I back off from the rock and roll for a while. So it was back to the routine of <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> A 16-inch record, affectionately called a pizza platter, was state-of-the-art in audio technology. There were no music cassettes, no videotapes, programs came on film reels, and just about everything was sent by mail. Satellites didn't exist. Sputnik wouldn't be launched for a couple of years yet. CFN might get news via shortwave radio, but it wasn't reliable. And a telephone line to the States to get news was still years away. So when it came to providing entertainment, members of CFN relied on another broadcasting axiom. When in doubt, improvise. And there was some original programming. There were some rather inventive people working at, S at CFN at that time, almost at SCN, but that was a little before SCN's time. There were some very clever people. And for example, one I recall, this occurred just before I joined CFN. They put together uh, Stephen Crane's Red Badge of Courage and performed it uh, for the cameras at CFN. All done with local personnel with the assistance of some actors from a local little theater. And it was well done. Broadcasters, by their very nature, have to be inventive. Creativity turned outward results in originality. Creativity turned sideways results in practical jokes. 
So I'm standing there thinking I'm all alone in the booth reading my copy, and the door quietly opens and a match lights my copy on fire right while I'm reading it. So I'm standing there trying to maintain my presence reading the copy while beating out the flames that are gradually working their way up the page. And I finally was able to get it out and didn't lose any words or anything. But those are some of the experiences I remember on television. The other stuff, but the fun things I remember. Jack Essex finished his Air Force tour in Panama, a time he said was quiet and peaceful. But in the next few years, life would change in Panama and at CFN. The critical year was 1964. Students, American and Panamanian, rioted over the placement of Panama's flag at Balboa High School. People died and change started. Talks to turn the canal over to Panama began in earnest. Also in 1963, June 6 to be exact, CFN became SCN, and a little more than a year later, Jerry Fry joined the staff as the unit's second program director. <laughs> 